the title of my presentation, as you see, is Developing Intercultural Competence in the Virtual Classroom. But before I begin, I would like to start first by conducting a poll, and I would request if Yvonne could just set it up. Yes, the first question is, are you aware of the exact meaning or definition of intercultural competence and what it implies? You have three choices, yes, no, and not sure. So please uh, click on the one that applies to you. Yes, I think 100% people have answered and uh, if yes, so the results are 36% yes, 14% no and 50% not sure. So I'm delighted to see that a lot of you are aware of what intercultural competence is and for those who are not, are not very sure, I do hope you will have something to take back with you from this presentation today. So I will quickly walk you through the outline. Uh, in my presentation, I will first talk a little bit about my background, which led to my interest in intercultural competence, move on to discuss what intercultural competence is, and then analyze the relation between productive language teaching and developing an interculturally effective classroom. Then I will discuss some of the challenges as well as the ways of circumventing the same to build intercultural competence in the virtual classroom. To start with my background, I came to Canada from India, which is a very unique country in itself in terms of the diversity of geographic locations, cultures, religions, languages, dialects, and food. India is a secular country, so in spite of being a practicing Hindu, I could study in a Catholic school and a global school where English was my first language right from lower kindergarten. In addition, in my early childhood, I grew up in a neighborhood where Muslims and Christians were in a majority. The girl you see in the red circle is me. I belong to the Bengali community in India, in, and uh, this is my school in the capital city of my state of Bengal. Yet, other than me and the girl you see right behind me in the picture, there was no other Bengali in my class. And the rest of them originated from different communities from the rest of India, but had been living in my city from their parents' generation. None of the others could speak my mother tongue Bengali, although they understood it you know, in varying degrees. And if we had to communicate in school, we would always have to speak in English. The lady you see beside me was our school principal, Sister Mary, who was British, and the lady beside her was our class teacher, and she was a Jew. The girl at the far end of that same row was of Chinese origin, but their family had been living in India from her great grandparents generation. It goes without saying that I was exposed to a rich diversity of religions and cultures right from my childhood. And this gave me a lot of cultural sensitivity and awareness, which actually helped me when I moved to such a multicultural place, such as Canada. Yet the multiculturalism I found here was amazing. When I was doing my postgraduate TESOL diploma, it was not only a great learning experience, but a revolution of sorts to be in the same classroom with people from so many different countries, such as India, Pakistan, China, South Korea, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Australia, Portugal, Trinidad and Tobago, Canada, and last but not least, Georgia. Here, I must mention, my classmate from Georgia always introduced himself as, I am from Georgia not the state of Georgia, but the country Georgia. And his assertiveness implied to me that maybe at some point he had faced ignorance of his cultural and national background from the people around him and that had negatively impacted him. However, my serious interest in intercultural competence began when I started to teach English as a volunteer in the Viet Sky project, which is run by Roger Gillespie from Canada and Yen Tran from Vietnam where I had one-on-one -on -one synchronous online sessions with school teachers in Vietnam through Zoom to develop their English speaking and conversational skills. 
One of the goals of this project has always been to create and promote intercultural understanding among volunteer teachers and the student participants so that the student participants especially may gain a better understanding of the culture of these English speaking countries. There are sections built into the format of the conversation where participants share information, including pictures about their respective cultures based on the given topics of the day, ranging from food to education to music and environment, just to name a few. And the tagline of the Vietsky project, as you can see here, is bring your cultural diversity into online conversations. And this is just a picture of me among the other volunteers on their website. So Newton, Sirigar, and Tran, with the help of individual case studies, have shown that for the good language teacher, intercultural awareness is a key starting point for effective intercultural teaching. So let's begin by first asking, what is this intercultural competence or awareness that the good language teacher is expected to possess? There are innumerable ways one can conceptualize intercultural competence. competence and Brian H. Spitzberg and Gabriel Shanion in their heuristic theoretical analysis of intercultural competence have said that intercultural competence is the appropriate and effective management of interaction between people who, to some degree or another, represent different or divergent affective, cognitive, and behavioral orientations to the world. These orientations will most commonly be reflected in such normative categories as nationality, race, ethnicity, tribe, religion, or region. To a large extent, therefore, intercultural interaction is tantamount to intergroup interaction. There are many models of intercultural competence, but if we follow Darla Deardorff's 2006 model of intercultural competence, the three key elements constituting it would be knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Knowledge also, re knowledge refers to awareness of our own biases and behaviors in order to respond in a culturally appropriate manner and refers to acquiring culture specific knowledge, sociolinguistic awareness and understanding culture specific trends. Skills include listening, observing and evaluating, analyzing and interpreting. It also includes critical thinking, leading to viewing and interpreting the world from other cultures' point of view and identifying one's own. Attitudes that need to be cultivated are curiosity, flexibility, and the willingness to adapt and be open to different ways of thinking and behaving. Respect for and appreciation of other cultures, worldviews and communication styles, and the ability and willingness to acknowledge and accept different behaviors and ideas in a non-judgmental way, especially opinions and perspectives with which we do not necessarily agree. As per UNESCO, intercultural competences are closely integrated with learning to know, to do, and be. Learning to know about cultural others provides the first step in gaining intercultural competences, a step that can never be complete, for there are always still more others to meet. Learning to do serves as the active step of interacting with cultural others. Through such interactions, people both apply knowledge already gained and acquire more, learning from interactions with others in the past and designing future interactions. Learning to be relies upon the reflective step of thinking about one's social self as having a place in the global world. All of this together contribute to learning to live in peace together. According to UNESCO, intercultural literacy constitutes of all the knowledge and skills necessary to the practice of intercultural competences, which has become an essential tool for modern life parallel to the development of information literacy or media literacy. The same UNESCO document mentions three ways in which members of a diverse group can understand one another, and these are shared experiences, conversations, and storytelling, examples of which I will discuss later when we discuss the ways intercultural competence can be practiced in the virtual classroom. According to UNESCO, it is very important to integrate 
intercultural competences and dialogue in formal as well as informal education for fostering harmonious relationships and unity beyond diversity. So now that we have clearly defined what intercultural competence is, before we move on, I would like to conduct the second poll. So I would please request Yvonne if you could set it up. So the question is, have you ever tried to develop intercultural competence in your virtual classroom? There are four options, always, sometimes, never, not sure. So 72% have participated so far. So if anybody else would like to participate. Okay, so we can end the poll maybe. Yes, so from uh, the 72 percent people who participated, we have 44 percent who have said always, 37 sometimes, 7% never and 11% not sure. So I'm very happy to see that there are so many people who have participated. And with this, we will move on to the next uh, slide. And we will discuss what the relationship between good effective language teaching and developing an interculturally effective classroom is. So our exploration of the meaning and importance of intercultural competence has shown that it's definitely an important skill for teachers to possess, especially as they can more deeply support and affirm the diverse students in their classes. Secondly, this creates an atmosphere of trust and rapport, which will enable learning. It clearly acknowledges diversity and promotes inclusion. Finally, the development of intercultural competences facilitates relationships and interactions among people from various origins and cultures, as well as within heterogeneous groups, all of whom must learn to live together in harmony. The personality patterns associated with good teachers in this context, as mentioned in the SAGE Handbook of Intercultural Competence, include interpersonal sensitivity, maturity, interpersonal openness, nurturance and empathy among others. It has been stressed that harmony is the chief goal of human behavior and thus communication competence would ultimately result in harmony in relationships with others. Darla Deardorff mentions the search for intercultural competence underscores the need for genuine respect and humility as we relate to one another, meaning that we arrive at the point of truly valuing each other and in so doing, bridge those differences through relationship building. In the end, intercultural competence is about our relationships with each other and ultimately our very survival as the human race as we work together to address the global challenges that confront us. It is quite understandable that the English classroom in any second language context is culturally heterogeneous. This is more so in a multicultural country like Canada, where a typical teacher will be involved in a variety of cultures of the specific academic discipline, the teacher's own culture that is brought to the classroom and the culture of the students themselves. Then how can this classroom dialogue take place in a virtual classroom where even the use of technology and video conferencing has a culture or dynamic of its own? Effective language learning will take place when, as Cramsh says, teachers and learners will be constantly engaged in creating a culture of a third kind through the give and take of classroom dialogue. So with this, we will move on to discussing what challenges the teacher may face in creating an interculturally effective virtual classroom. But before that, I would like you to share in the chat what you think may be the challenges or barriers to developing intercultural competence in the virtual classroom. So if you could just type a few words in the chat.
world politics, people's biases, So if anybody else would like to share differences in communication patterns, time, there are so many things to cover in a course, our own self-consciousness, being absorbed in ourselves rather than the learner, offending someone, unwillingness, cultural differences in engaging or interrupting in conversation, difficulty in creating connection for learners who have never met in person, especially when video screens aren't shared, learned biases, less personal, for sharing unless you have a good class connection. Past trauma. These are all fantastic points raised by you. Thank you so much for sharing. So I would like to move on to discuss what I consider to be the challenges and a lot of them overlap with what you're saying. And so one of the greatest challenges, of course, is in the format of the classroom that it is remote and online with both synchronous and asynchronous portions built in. As we don't meet our students and interact face to face in the classroom, we often miss out on a lot of firsthand knowledge and awareness of cultural behavior, body language and attitudes that we might have discovered about them through classroom presence, conversations and social interaction in class and sometimes during breaks. Another challenge presents itself in the form of attitudinal barriers, and this affects both teachers and students. Teachers might have biases, which they need to be aware of and overcome. And I'd just like to share a small anecdote. When I taught a face-to-face -face upper, level, upper level evening class at the Chang School of Continuing Education at Ryerson University, I had some students eating heavy meals as I taught them. As a person who had been an assistant professor of English in India for over nine years, where discipline and class decorum was of paramount importance, I was not used to this sight, and it did come initially as a shock to me. However, I was careful not to react and carry on with my class and just observe suspending judgment. I noticed that the eating did not affect their class participation at all. I also realized since the class began at 6.30 p.m. and went on for three hours, the students might actually be having their dinner, especially as the ones who were eating in class lived very far from downtown Toronto and had a long commute back home. This observation increased my acceptance of the situation and the classes continued harmoniously. I was glad I could check my implicit bias that I had spontaneously based on my past background and experiences. So the third challenge is attitudinal barriers that affect students too. Students might struggle with feelings of shyness, fear, or lack of confidence, which prevent them from wholehearted participation in the class. And sometimes there are students, as someone mentioned, world politics, you often, if there are, you know, belong to different countries which are not in peace in the world and they are, you know, having wars with each other, then that also affects their attitude towards their participants. Fourthly, we have social barriers which acts as another hurdle as students, mostly new immigrants, may suffer from a feeling of a lack of social integration in the new country. Furthermore, language barriers make lower level learners struggle to communicate and this may prevent any proper interaction and relationship building. To make matters worse, in a virtual classroom, students might not have their videos on, and sometimes teachers may be only interacting with black rectangles with names written on them, and if one is lucky, maybe a profile picture. And this may be due to various factors, and sometimes even network and bandwidth issues. And excuse my frivolity, but I couldn't help sharing these funny memes on virtual meetings, where they are compared to modern day seances. I can truly attest that I myself have on one occasion said, I can't hear you nor see you, but can you hear me? If yes, please type something in the chat. And about the awkward pauses for the microphones to turn on on the right, it is not always the students, but I myself have been guilty of speaking eloquently while muted. And my students have had to remind me that I needed to unmute myself to impart those precious nuggets of wisdom. So another challenge may be the number of cultures the students in your class represent. If they are from too many countries and cultures, it might seem a difficult and near impossible task for the teacher to acquire sufficient culture-specific knowledge and awareness of all of them. 
in one link ESL class I taught last year, I had 20 students from countries near and far, such as Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, Slovenia, Russia, Cameroon, Morocco, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, India, Pakistan, Philippines, China, and South Korea, which if we add up, makes up 15 countries. I can never claim to have the knowledge of so many countries and cultures, and I have to rely on my attitudes of openness and curiosity and skills of listening and observing to be interculturally competent. Last but not least, to acquire the knowledge and skills that intercultural competence demands, what one requires from the instructor are time and environment for research. I think one of you already mentioned this in the chat. And from the program, resources, a curriculum, and professional development. Instructors, such as in LINK courses, are mandated to follow the Canadian language benchmarks and PBLA, and this does not include intercultural competences or intercultural literacy that UNESCO speaks of. The systemic and institutional requirements and responsibilities might overwhelm the teacher and discourage him or her to include anything extra in their lesson that is not exactly mandated by the program. This is especially true as ready-made resources are rarely found on this topic. So what may be some ways to circumvent these challenges to make sure the classes are still interculturally effective and the classroom dialogue takes place in spite of the hurdles on the way? To elaborate, I would like to now share some of the practices that I have tried in my teaching in keeping with the knowledge, skills, and attitudes of the intercultural competence model of Darla Deardorf discussed previously, aligned with UNESCO's ways in which group members can understand one another, such as shared experiences, conversations, and storytelling, all of which personally for me have been useful and successful in building relationships and creating an inclusive atmosphere in my class. So far, I would like to clarify, I have always taught a stage two multi-level class with CLB levels ranging from six to nine. So let's start with shared experiences. The first topic I would like to mention here is something I feel is the shared experience of all people from other cultures who immigrate and study in Canada. And this relates to the use and pronunciation of their names of different cultural backgrounds. A lot of my students, especially those from South Korea, China, and Vietnam, did offer me an alternative English nickname to pronounce, but were pleasantly surprised and happy when I chose to learn the pronunciation of their original name and call them by it, and even asked them to correct my pronunciation if I got it wrong. One's name is one's identity, and it's as Kamala Harris recently said, a gift from your family. And I think it is very important for me as a teacher to have the attitude to value and respect that. And I could sense that my students were happy when I pronounced their original names as they could should be pronounced. I've always felt that if we expect our students to learn English, which is a second language for them, to the point of studying and working using it, we as teachers can make the attempt to learn just a first name belonging to their language, however difficult it may be to pronounce. It may be challenging, but not impossible at all only one or two words after all. To gain culture specific knowledge that Darla Deardorff mentions, I've always spent the first couple of classes getting to know my students better. One activity I do in my first class is introduce your partner, where the student pairs have to go into breakout rooms in the online classroom and find the answers to the questions that I provide. I always add as a disclaimer that if they are not comfortable with any question, they are free to not answer it, as I do not want them to feel under any circumstances that I'm encroaching on their privacy. They are expected to remember the answers their partners do share with them from the questions provided and introduce their partner or classmate to the rest of the class once they return to the main room post the breakout session. This activity serves many purposes. One, it gives an opportunity to the students to interact with each other right from day one, which they would not have got if they merely introduced themselves in the main room. This is important as they are not present in a physical classroom, and this helps build classroom community. Two, through getting to know each other, they are still practicing two language skills, listening and speaking. 
finally, it gives me a lot of knowledge and awareness about their background, all of which I note down as the students speak. All of this adds on to the formal needs assessment I do later through the filling up of a different set of questions in a Google form as per PBLA requirements. Another speaking activity I always do in the initial classes to add on to my culture specific awareness and to make my students feel included and welcome is a cultural object presentation. In this activity, they are to choose any object that presents their culture or even any picture of any object from their culture if they do not possess the actual artifact itself and then share information about it to the rest of the class. The skill is speaking and the CLB competency area of this presentation is sharing information. Apart from providing a checklist of what they need to do in their presentation as per their CLB levels, I even model the activity for them by presenting an object from my own culture and sharing information about it. It is wonderful to hear students speak with pride about the special artifacts from their culture and learn about the important cultural aspects they shared and sometimes they even share the emotion connection they have with that object. So this contributes to the building of relationships in the class and the other students are very happy to know their classmates and their backgrounds better. So I'll just show you a few pictures from what my students shared in some of the presentation. So this is a t-shirt which a student from Venezuela shared and it, it was given to her by her mother before she came to Canada and it depicts downtown Caracas which is her town and its important landmarks. My student from Colombia shared the picture of the Aguadeño hat, which is worn by the people of her community, especially in the flower festival, which is very famous there. And on the right, we have a garment called the Chania Choli, which is from Gujarat, India, and worn in the Navaratri celebrations. This is a famous uh, stringed musical instrument from Afghanistan called Rubab, which is also played in Pakistan, where one of my students was from and where she really, she learned to play this. So this was something very close to her heart. And this is a set of the Matroshka nesting dolls, which my student from Russia shared. And these are all pictures shared by my students. And this is just a sample of, that I'm showing you. One way of including the shared experiences of a variety of learners in the class is to make sure that the activities you create reflect on their lived experience. Another effort I put in to make my classroom interculturally competent was to include all of my students' cultures while preparing a Kahoot quiz as a warm-up activity on International Women's Day last year. And this is something I'm also working on this year too. Yes, it did take a lot of time and research to find out about the famous women from my students' countries, be it Venezuela, Colombia, or Slovenia. It was relatively easier for me to prepare questions on India and Canada because I personally had more knowledge about these places. The students enjoyed playing the Kahoot and appreciated my research and effort in finding out about the famous women of their countries as I was drawing on their experiences in their countries. So the first picture on the left is that of Polycarpa Salavarieta, who is now considered a heroine of the independence of Colombia and the day of the Colombian woman is commemorated on the anniversary of her death. The Picture in the middle is that of Teresa Carino, a famous pianist from Venezuela. And on the right, you have Kalpana Chawla, an Indian American astronaut and engineer who was the first woman of Indian origin to go to space. This Kahoot helped me find out something last year that I will always remember and cherish. For my student from Slovenia, I had prepared a question on a famous Slovenian sports person, Tina Maze, the most successful Slovenian ski racer in history with a career that culminated with two gold medals at the 2014 Winter Olympics. My Slovenian student told me that Tina had actually been his neighbor in Slovenia and even shared a few more details about her and her childhood. I was astounded. This was such an unexpected and a welcome coincidence. The next way, as mentioned by UNESCO, is storytelling. I've always adopted the attitude of curiosity and shown respect for and appreciation of other cultures and worldviews. So every month I make sure that I not only encourage students to share with their classmates the festivals and traditions they celebrate, but I also share with them the various important days celebrated in Canada. So last year I mentioned that my culture celebrated the new year in mid-April. My students, 
uh, who were Muslim described Ramadan and Eid, whereas my Christian students spoke of Easter. In the month of May, when I was talking of the celebration of Mother's Day, my South Korean student told me about the celebration of Parents' Day in our country, which was greeted with much approval from some men from other cultures in my class who disapproved of the fact that worldwide Mother's Day received more importance than Father's Day and felt that a Parents' Day was a better celebration as it was actually more egalitarian. That's again a different perspective that emerged through sharing of cultural diversity. South Korea also celebrates Children's Day in the same month. Since we include Canadian cultures and festivals, along with talking about student cultures, we talked of Canada Day in July, Labor Day, Orange Shirt Day, or the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation in September. We also completed activities on Thanksgiving, Halloween, and Christmas. In January, we discussed how New Year is celebrated all over the world. This February, we discussed Black History Month, Groundhog Day, and even Pink Shirt Day, this Wednesday, February 23rd. And this kind of storytelling about your own culture is really eye-opening. When I asked my Mexican student about Cinco de Mayo celebrations in our culture, which is pretty famous, she was very categorical that it was an US celebration and not a Mexican festival at all. Although in the US, it is a holiday and celebrates Mexican heritage. So before our winter break, we had a virtual holiday potluck where my students delivered presentations on the special food from their cultures, which they always cooked during holidays and even shared pictures with detailed recipes. I've only shared two pictures here of the spring roll from Vietnam and the nastar or the pineapple tart from Indonesia. So now I will move on to speak of the third way mentioned by UNESCO and that is conversations. We have discussed that as per the model of intercultural competence of Deardorf, it is crucial to have the ability and willingness to acknowledge and accept different behaviors in a non-judgmental way, however strange they may appear from one's own standpoint. This is something that I've always cultivated as a teacher trait. When I was teaching in the Viet Sky project, my Vietnamese student in the initial classes had kept his video camera, which was not inbuilt in his laptop, sideways by which I could not see him face to face and necessarily saw his profile as I taught him. I was perplexed and did feel a little awkward teaching his profile, but I was extremely patient and I felt that there must be a specific reason for his behavior, which may be unusual to me, but not so to him. So I was non-judgmental and gave him the space to be himself. As we built our rapport and trust, after a few classes, he adjusted his external camera and we were interacting face to face. A couple of classes later, when he had grown more comfortable interacting with me, I did ask him why he had avoided looking at me straight. When he confessed that he had reservations making direct eye contact, which he said was often the case of people in his culture. I also shared with him how direct eye contact was expected in North America. So it was really great to have this open conversation with him at the appropriate time as it helped both of us understand each other better. In a virtual classroom, we know that video conferencing has a culture of its own, where we as teachers would ideally like our students to keep their videos on, but microphones muted unless they are speaking. In one of the classes, I had a few students who preferred keeping their videos off. This may have been because of personal reasons or attitudinal or social barriers they faced or even network and bandwidth issues. I did share our school policy of keeping the videos on with them, requesting them politely that it would be nice if they switched on their videos unless they had a serious reason for doing otherwise. Yet I saw a couple of students were still keeping their videos off without providing any reason. I did not call them out as I felt they might have their own valid reasons for doing so and instead waited patiently. A couple of days later in a warm up activity, I included a question about the advantages and disadvantages of online versus face to face classes. A couple of students shared that the prime disadvantage of online classes was that they were unable to see all the students and see their reactions or understand their body language, which would not be the case in face-to-face -face classes. I could not let this golden opportunity pass up and immediately jumped in by saying that the same logic they gave was the rationale behind the schools asking all the students to keep their videos on for better student-teacher interaction and proper evaluation.
I also reassured them that I would never force them to switch on their video if they had an important reason to keep it off, but I would clearly appreciate their informing me that they had an issue. A remarkable change occurred after that open conversation, and since then, all students of that class kept their videos on, and when one or two have not been able to, for reasons of their own, they have always informed me. Nonetheless, they are also aware that during any synchronous assessment, it is mandatory for them to keep their videos on. To help build interpersonal relationships, which is the goal of intercultural competence, and to reduce social isolation and even build classroom community, I've always incorporated breakout room activities and discussions in all my classes every day. This gives the student an opportunity to interact freely with each other while discussing on the topic provided or working collaboratively on an exercise. And it gives me an opportunity to learn more about their thoughts worldviews and communication style as I observe them when I drop into the breakout rooms. They also enjoy this discussion activities tremendously. Another thing I consciously do whenever I teach any module is encourage them to share their culture specific behavior about the topics being taught. In this way, we increase our knowledge and acceptance of the different cultures represented in the class while learning about what is acceptable in Canada. This compare and contrast approach also helps in better retention of what is the norm in Canada, which I feel they as newcomers who are trying to integrate in a new society would like to know. For instance, while teaching the employment module and talking about resumes, one Colombian student and one Russian student shared that it was quite normal in their culture to have a photo on the resume, whereas it is just the opposite in Canada. While doing the module on interacting with others and teaching about making small talk conversation topics, many students shared how it was not taboo to talk about personal issues and health and family matters in small talk conversations, which is not the case here. While talking of pragmatics, such as turn taking in conversations and interrupting politely at the correct time, a few students from Asian and Middle Eastern countries shared that speaking all at the same time was not exactly frowned upon, even if it was best avoided. One of my students from Philippines, however, shared that in her culture, they would always take turns in speaking, which aligns closely to the North American communication pattern. So these conversations were enjoyable as the students shared the behaviors in their cultures and learned about what is acceptable here. Again, while doing the module on academic skills, they had to write the compare and contrast essay that they were taught in the class. And the topic that was given was healthcare of Canada in relation to the healthcare of their home country. It is important for us to have these conversations, not only about the cultures of the students, but also about Canadian culture and history. Last year for National Indigenous Peoples Day, I felt that it is very important for newcomers to know about the Indigenous people of this country, their history and culture, and learn to respect them, so as to gain more culture-specific knowledge about the country they have adopted as their new home. And in the third week of June, I arranged a presentation from Toronto Region Conservation Authority on Indigenous peoples in Canada, where they learned about the history and culture of these people. And this was also delivered by the coordinator through Zoom. I had arranged this long before the shocking and the heart-wrenching discovery of the remains of the 215 children in the site of the erstwhile Kamloops Indian Residential School in British Columbia. But this online presentation became all the more relevant and timely because of this ghastly discovery. Following the success of that presentation, later I also arranged two more presentations, one about the contact period when the European settlers reached Canada and interacted with the Indigenous people, and the other about protecting and visiting natural areas in Canada. Both delivered by the coordinator of TRCA and both gave my students and me a lot of knowledge and were greatly appreciated by my learners. And Claude Lamblet, who is the president of the Society for Intercultural Education, Training and Research, has said, in a world where polarization and individualism are getting stronger and stronger, the practice of intercultural dialogue is the tool for constructive exchanges between people of different cultures. It is an essential element of equality in our societies and a resource for living together and integration. So how did I assess if this intercultural dialogue, which is the tool for constructive exchanges, is taking place? 
As per PBLA requirements, I've regularly taken learner reflections from students, and it has given me great pleasure to see that my students who belong to various countries have enjoyed doing the classes and engaging in discussions with each other from different cultures. Reflections from students are regarded as direct evidence, and here I would like to share some screenshots with you. This is question number five of one of the learner reflections I had taken, which inquired about what they thought about the numerous group activities they did, mostly discussions and other collaborative exercises in the breakout rooms. The answers emphasized on the fact they liked sharing their ideas, listening to the different accents, and speaking to each other, learning from each other, interacting with people, and that they felt close to each other. Others shared that they liked sharing their thoughts, found these activities helpful because they got a chance to improve their social interaction and also got the time for small talk. They enjoyed the fun element as well as gaining a lot of knowledge. In the summer school, one student specifically said that she enjoyed the conversation about different countries and cultures and thanked me for it. For me, this feedback in the learner reflection was the assessment and evidence that proved that there is harmony of relationships in the class and an effective classroom dialogue has taken place in spite of the challenges mentioned earlier. This was the external outcome of the process and it has given me the confidence that I am on the right track. In my current class, I make sure I build in the place for conversations in breakout rooms every day. A few days ago, I asked my students to share their opinions on this Jamboard that I present to you on what their thoughts were about the conversational speaking activities that we regularly had in the breakout rooms. I will draw your attention to the comment on the top left, which mentions learning about classmates' cultures, and on the bottom right, which, among other advantages, found understanding Canadian culture during the practice important. Of course, here I would like to provide a note of caution that intercultural competence cannot be fully gained in the span of one or a few courses or modules and it's a lifelong process which requires the continuous acquisition of knowledge and the cultivation of the correct attitudes and skills. Another point to be kept in mind is that we should also avoid the pitfall of assuming the cultural behavior of one individual to be representative of the whole culture. We should have the attitude of openness to not stereotype new people we meet based on our experience of past people from the same culture. There will be broad similarities and yet there may be differences too and the individual may often not represent the group and the good language teacher should always exercise the skills of listening, observing and evaluating the student as he or she is through getting to know him or her better. It is important to be open and to embrace diversity. I hope that with my account of how I amalgamate Deirdre's elements and UNESCO's ways in the virtual classroom, I've been able to share some of the ways I have explored in the possibilities of having an interculturally effective classroom where there is mutual respect and inclusion in the class. I'm glad to have begun the journey towards intercultural competence expected of a teacher in a multicultural classroom, but I do understand that I have a lot more knowledge to gain and have to build on my skills further. So this is the UNESCO's 2013 intercultural competences concept conceptual and operations framework that I referred to. It is an open access document easily found on the internet. In 2020, UNESCO also piloted the methodology of story circles, which is authored by Darla Deodorf in the Manual for Developing Intercultural Competences in five countries, Thailand, Costa Rica, Zimbabwe, Austria, and Tunisia. And this is already being used in these five countries. This is, this has a separate, uh, you know, it's a document for in-person classes as well as for use in the virtual classroom. This is something which requires a lot of time and because of which I'm yet to try it in my own class. So before I end, I would like to uh, request Yvonne to just set up poll number three. So poll number three, the question is, will you try developing intercultural competence in your virtual classroom?
75% have participated so far. So, And it's wonderful to see that all of you are saying yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. So we have 77% people who have participated and all of you have said yes. Thank you so much for saying that. And as far as I'm concerned, as a teacher committed to unlearn, learn, and relearn, and help for students with empathy, suspending judgment, I would like to conclude with the words of the American poet, Robert Frost, that sum up my goal in my classroom. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Thank you so much for attending this session. These are my references. And if you have any questions, I would look forward to answering them. And if you would like to contact me by email or LinkedIn, the information is on the slide. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carmita. I know that I personally learned so much from you about embracing diversity in the classroom. And it was just such a pleasure to hear all of your ideas of, of techniques that you've implemented into your own classrooms. Uh, we had some good comments in the chat and I think we may have some questions. So is it okay if, if we post some questions for you in the chat? You could even ask me if, if whichever is okay. comfortable. Sure. If, so if you'd like to ask any questions, we do have um, just over 10 minutes. Um, if anybody has a question, please feel free to unmute themselves and ask or to put the question in the chat. Thank you so much for your appreciation. I can, I'm reading the comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm not taking all your names individually, but I would like to thank everybody who has attended this presentation and encouraging me with your positive comments. Thank you so much. Tracy, maybe I could ask a question? Yes, please, Emily. Okay. Um, I'm wondering what approach Pramita would take in, in um, sort of familiarizing learners with um, the kind of openness to difference that is part of Canadian culture, not just in terms of um, culture, but in terms of sexual orientation and sexual identity and issues like that, that can be um, challenging for learners um, whose cultures do not accept um, that sort of diversity. And, and what sort of strategies do you have for making that um, work in the classroom? Yes, thank you so much for sharing this question. Actually, in one classroom, we did have a discussion on the different identities and the use of pronouns and how you know to address people according to their pronouns. So basically, I, I never really met anybody in my class so far. I was lucky enough who was really opposed to it. And they were generally open. So when we had this discussion, and uh, this is something I, I, was, I would say I'm, I'm lucky because when we had this discussion, we talked of the different pronouns, we talked of the different identities, we talked of filling up forms in Canada where you have an option. And it's not only you know when you fill up forms and you have to fill up the sexual identity. So we, because as I said, we have conversations in our class, which is built into the format of the way I conduct classes. We have breakout room activities we have conversations so when this came up we actually had a very healthy discussion and I and I did mention that and I always because it is something as you said alien to some countries and some cultures or some people are not you know very accepting of this so I, I always acknowledge the opposite viewpoint when I begin so when if I am giving my views, I always start with saying that this is not acceptable to many and it is this it's not a question of right and wrong, it is just a question of looking at it, but this is the norm here and this is uh, it's a matter of individual choice. It is a matter of, it is not anything, there is no religious angle to it, there is nothing. So we have these open discussions and when people, sometimes when students come up with uh, questions in this issue, Thankfully, I'm not uh, because, as I said, I deal with students who are always stage two, mm -hmm. uh, multi levels, so CLB level six to nine. So maybe they are they are more read and they are more in and they are you know more familiar with the Western and the English culture. Because I have actually, when we had this discussion in the class, and one of my students told me like you know we have so many pronouns now and and she asked me when should I use they and when should I use them because one person had a confusion regarding that when to use they and them. 
and the kind of differences between he and you know he him his her hers or she and when to use they and them so we actually had this open discussion it sounds like open discussion is a great tool for um, yes i mean it has worked for me ideas. personally yes it That's has worked terrific. for me personally yes Okay, thank you. And I Amanda. always acknowledge with, I, my, I personally, I always start with, like, I would say, yes, this is the view, and there are so many things people say against it. And I, and I always have that, you know, accept, they, they see that I accept the different viewpoints myself. Like, I'm not saying, I'm, I, I don't start with making it black and white, and this is wrong, and that is right. And I say these are different views. They have their valid reasons coming from, you know, different cultures, and, and they have their own personal reasons. Okay, so that is uh, there. So I always uh, acknowledge, uh, start with acknowledging uh, what is, you know, negative, saying that it exists. I don't try to push it on the carpet. So, and then we talk about it openly to me, for me in my class, it has worked. Thank you so much. Yes. We have um, a question in the chat. How do you handle cultural conflict or tension if it happens in the class? I mean, it has not uh, happened in my class in terms of cultural tension, but it, I did have a, something called a language tension in the sense uh, there was a, one student who has a very strong uh, regional accent from her country. And uh, whenever she was in the breakout room with another student, uh, uh, the other student uh, met me individually, had a meeting with me and said she didn't want to be in the same room with the other student. And this was not because she was, uh, you know, uh, upset that she had a strong regional accent or had anything against her, but she was afraid of constantly asking her to repeat herself and offending her. So I did not uh, put, I, I, I kept that in mind. So whenever I was doing the breakout rooms, I had to make sure that, you know, I had to manually ensure that she didn't go into the same room for, and this was in the initial stage of the classes. So it went on for one month. I made sure they were not in the same breakout room. I respected what she wanted because she said like she, she didn't want to offend the other student because she was finding it hard to understand her. But then we also had these discussion when I asked questions in class, we do activities, classwork. So she also got familiar to her accent and we also do pronunciation activities. So this person has also improved in pronunciation in um, many, uh, you know, over the weeks and so, and over the months. So after one and a half months, again, just randomly, I put them in the same breakout room just to see what's happening, just to experiment with, you know, if she will come back again and tell me later, like, you know, I asked you not to put me in the same breakout room, why did you? She didn't. And uh, they had a wonderful discussion. They came back, they made the presentation they were supposed to make, and it just went on in, as normal. Because in the main breakout room, when we did classwork activities, they were again interacting because I keep a lot of uh, space. Like, it's not always only me talking. I make sure everybody gets a chance to answer. Even if it's an exercise, they have to talk, uh, you know, give the answers to. Everybody responds. I make sure I do that. So that really helped. And yes, in cultural tension, like I will say, like currently what's happening in the world uh, scenario. So in my class, I do not have anybody from Ukraine, but I do have a student from Russia. And uh, she is undergoing a lot of tension because she also does not support the war. And uh, she is afraid. So that, you know, because in her, where she lives, she's feeling some kind of, you know, insecurity because she's feeling uh, like there are other people who are reacting against her nationality because people don't know she's Russian. She's afraid of her children's safety. There's a lot of going on back in Russia and she doesn't support the war. She feels they are all the same. So she's, this is obviously a current situation is causing a lot of stress. So today in the class itself, I mean, I've taken the class in the morning and joined the presentation. Today in the class itself, we discussed this issue in the classroom and we all like had this open conversation where we like, you know, we supported her and we, told her obviously it's not her fault that the war is happening and that we are all with her and if she needs any support then uh, she can definitely reach out and I plan to send her uh, I will do it after this there are, we have resources mental health resources provided by our organization for you know students and their kids so I will email them to her after this Great. Do we have any last questions? I have a 
have a quick question um, about negotiating some of the practical ramifications of cultural differences. So for instance, if some of my students are comfortable talking over each other and others like the turn taking, um, you know, how much do I honor their, their enthusiasm and, and just what they're comfortable with and how much do I, you know, kind of what's the line with introducing this is what others do or what we do here in Canada? Yes, I think the best way is it, we have an advantage in the virtual classroom that we have the raise hand option. So I always tell my students that when they are like, they would have to raise their hands. Sometimes they talk and they, because I, when we had the module on uh, social interactions and interaction styles at work, I've repeatedly told them what the norm here is and that turn taking is very important and interrupting is not the best way of having the conversation. So they are aware of it. They do raise their hands. Sometimes when it gets like, you know, excited and they talk, they realize they're like, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you continue. No, no, sorry. So, you know, so then they, because I have constantly emphasized on this and I keep on telling them when you have, when you're wanting to contribute, just raise your hand. So this I think is a great advantage in a virtual classroom because in a real classroom, this would actually be, I personally feel a little more difficult to manage. Can I ask how you would manage it in, in an actual classroom? In an actual classroom, I think I would again, always emphasize the importance and I think I would have to physically ask them to raise their hands. That's great. Um, thank you so much, Paramita. Um, excellent presentation. We're thrilled you were able to join us today and I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much.